Yep. Electric utility board will come to uh, come to order in open session. I understand we don't have any uh, public comments on item six, so we'll go directly to item seven. Update and report by the director of electric utilities or his designee regarding customer service, business center practices, procedures and policies, billing procedures, and helping out staff and performance, Mr. McConnell. Mr. Chairman, we, we uh, have the normal report that starts on page 15 and I typically call out the highlights that I like to report on. And so the, uh, the rate charts do not have our, do not reflect the lowering of our pass through, which started in February 1st. So I think once you, uh, once you see that pass through, you'll see that we're in really good shape. But even as it stands, we're, we're well below the state average you know, electric rates. We're in pretty good shape. <coughs> Going over to uh, page 20, the uh, business office recap. The uh, wait time again was pretty low, 41 seconds. And the, uh, the call handling time of three minutes and 51 seconds is the shortest level we have recorded since we've been tracking that metric. I thought that was not worth it. Good job in the call center. The uh, PPRF went into effect February 1st. And that amounts to about $11.73 savings per customer uh, that uses 1,000 kilowatt hours of electricity. That's a pretty pretty significant decrease, 17.1%. Of course, all that is related to the, uh, the really cheap natural gas prices that are out, out there right now that we're just passing through. Hey, would you go back to 16? I'm just curious what you yeah. the SPS on the That's when they had a rebate. They had a rebate same thing. Now they just gave it back in one month as opposed to spreading it out over time. We're kind of, kind of refunding ours over time. So. I noticed, um, I don't know what, it seems like the uh, Austin Energy and CPS, they're, uh, they seem to be trending more down than they had been in previous months or years or the other one to be charged. They, they are uh, benefiting from some pretty cheap fuel costs as well, and I think most of their reduction has been related to their pass-through. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're looking good. Austin and San Antonio have, have historically been among the cheapest providers in the state. And I think, uh, they've got a, a blended portfolio. They've got some coal resources and some nuclear resources, which kind of tend to hold their averages up when gas prices are as cheap as they are right now. But. Uh, and, then, and there are both of them are also doing a lot with renewables, the solar and the wind. Uh, so they've got really uh, balanced portfolios, and right now their rates are pretty attractive. So moving on to the uh, distribution recap on page 21, the uh, commercial development in Lubbock just continues to continues to amaze me. There's just a lot of stuff going on in that town. Uh, this particular month, there were 10 new projects that uh, changed status to beginning con or in construction, started construction, uh, building in construction. And then there's four that got removed from this list, including companies like uh, Aspen, Aspen Creek Grill. I don't know if y'all had a chance to get there yet, but that was one that was on the list last month and it's been pulled off. So, so we are removing them as we complete them. And then the, uh, the 10 that got changed to building under construction include the 2100 at Overton Park, which is a huge complex not too far from here that y'all probably observed in the process of being constructed. And I think that was the main things that I was going to report on. Are there any questions? Any questions for Mr. McCullough? Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry. Mike Bowman, you have this Monsanto. Okay, uh, Monsanto, as I understand it, the, the work is, uh, has gotten to the point where we're, we're, we're boring under interstate, interstate out there close to it. We've got the distribution lines constructed up to that point. We're having to bore under the interstate. And that work is progressing pretty well. Uh, I think we're we're on track to get service to them within the next next few weeks for their temporary construction power. But well, I think we're ahead of the game because they're not they, they haven't even got their electrician lined up to start doing the temporary temporary power yet. Anything I should add to that, Steve? No, I think that yeah. Is that pretty accurate? Pretty good process to run the interstate. 
Now they've, they've uh, been working, working pretty hard to try to meet the timeline that we promised to promise we would meet. Just out of curiosity, how many of them have to be uh, 60 inches. It's low as well, or it's shallow as well, I should say. So it's a, it's a large bore. I think it's 30 inch bore. 30 inch casing. Right. So 30 inch bore, it takes quite a machine to do a 30 inch hole. And then you pull push casing in there when you go, and then you put the conduits in the casing <coughs> after that. So it'll be it'll be there for other for other features that we might want to put in there at some future point. How much does that cost? Cost. <laughs> yeah. What's the cost? What's the cost? Yeah. Um, I guess. Generally, you don't have to be exact. I believe that board, it was a dry board that had to bring a special crew in. And I believe it was around $300,000 for the dry board. It was an expensive board. I actually pulled the crew out of Montana or someplace to get this done. So they start up at, um, this is not, yeah. they start up at grade, like at the access road and then go down and under and back up? They actually have a pit over on the west side of the interstate. You drive up by there and it's just this enormous pit and they have a big machine that pushes an auger with the casing underneath the interstate and it comes back up on the other side. So did they dig that pit? Yes. For this? Yes. Good stuff. Any other questions on the director's report? Okay. If not, we'll go to item eight. Discuss financial and capital statements, financing options, audits, and financial policies, low and fire and life related debt insurance issues, reserve capital funding, cost allocation, revenue and expense projections, and low and fire and life. And I think that starts on page 25, Mr. Birchville. All right. Yeah. Start off with, uh, as I normally do, on a monthly basis, show you the, where the rates were uh, currently. You can see, as Dave was mentioning, uh, we did lower the rates in the beginning of February, as the board approved. So you can see where we were, the average user, 1,000 kilowatt hours, was paying about $100.94. Beginning of February, that would have dropped to $89 using the same amount of kilowatt hours. So a substantial drop there, about 17% on the pass-through rate. Overall, about 11% reduction. Overlay Excel uh, Energy's prices, these are the prices that would be paid in if you lived in Amarillo. Uh, you can see they are slightly below us through January, but we expect that we'll be significantly below XL Energy beginning in February. Still, over the last couple of years, being an, being an LPNL customer, you save about $140 from what customers in Amarillo have paid for the same amount of energy. One thing I wanted to point out this month, the pass-through, uh, as, as you know, the reason we reduced that was because we were in an over-collected status, and you can see how those green bars have have increased over the last several months. And uh, again, in February, after that rate was implemented, we did under collect for the month. So we have, as expected, begun drawing down uh, the, the over collected amount. So it, it's working as we'd anticipated and we'll continue to update y'all and monitor that every month going forward. On page 26 of your uh, agenda is the balance sheet, the asset side of the balance sheet and, and really if you look at total assets from uh, September through the current they're almost dead even to where they were a few changes on uh, cash and investments are up a, a good bit a lot of that has to do with the the over collected status that we're in and that'll be drawn down the receivables are back down to normal levels uh, we uh, this time last year we had about 22.5 million in, in receivables so we're uh, just about in line with where we are historically there Restricted investments are up a little bit. We set aside one twelfth of our debt service payment every month, and so that, that builds up until the point that we make our uh, payments on our, at least on the interest portion. So that that grows over time. But overall, assets are about where they were at the end of the fiscal year. On uh, the next page, page twenty-seven of your backup is the liability section. Um, a few changes there. Um, accounts payable is down. The, the payments that we have made to uh, 
WTMPA and then onto Excel for purchase power is down compared to where they were in, in uh, September. So you can see about a $4 million difference in payables, most of that related to that Excel bill. Uh, deferred revenues, which is where we have uh, recorded the overcollected status of our uh, collections. And so you can see we're about $8.7 million overcollected at the end of January. Uh, in, we were at about $2.2 million overcollected as of September 30th. Customer deposits continue to come down. We're down about a million three from where we uh, were at, at year end. Uh, to date, we have rebated almost $2 million of deposits. Uh, on average, we're running 80 to 100,000 a month on rebates. Uh, obviously, we have collected new deposits totaling about 600,000 since the end of the fiscal year. So the net of that gets you that $1.3 million. Uh, basically, that uh, those are the major changes in uh, the, the liability side of the balance sheet. Moving on to the income statement on page 28, uh, you can see revenues are down uh, from this time last year. Most of that has to do with the lower uh, cost of uh, purchase power, which you, if you go down a little bit, you can see purchase power is 40.6 million this year compared to 46.8 million last year, so a $6 million reduction there. Personnel services are up uh, a little bit, and the reason for that is we've had 10 pay payrolls this year compared to nine this time last year, so there's an ex extra payroll in there, so that's the difference. So once we kind of get even, I think our next month where we have three payrolls is in May, so we'll kind of catch up and be even a little bit more comparable uh, beginning in May. Uh, supplies and maintenance are up also. Uh, most of that has to do with water and sewer charges at the at Cook unit, which was operating uh, during the some during the winter season, so that drove up some of those utility costs. So those are the, the big changes on the income statement. Moving on to the budget comparison, um, this is on page 29, I believe, of your of your agenda. Uh, this is a high level overview of that page, but you can see what I've done is that third column kind of shows percentage wise where we are on actual uh, expenditures compared to budget and then the next the last column is where we were this time last year so you can see we're really right on track or almost even with where we were last year our revenues are a little bit greater as a percentage basis of budget compared to last year and one big difference in off-system sales we're at three percent compared to ten percent last year there's a couple of reasons for that uh, the main reason is that the cook unit is is out of service this year and so we're not receiving some, those revenues from Excel Energy uh, this time last year, we had received about 650000 on that unit contingent agreement with Excel. And this year, we've received about 328000 on that. Uh, we have had power marketing revenues this year, about 100000 in sales into the SPP integrated marketplace. This time last year, we didn't have any sales into the marketplace. So that's some of the differences there. On the expense side, our cost and error level expenditures are less than uh, this time last year. Fund level is about dead even, and our purchase power is a little bit less as a percent of budget this year compared to last. So right on track, no concerns at this point on the budget. And then my last slide is just a quick overview of the capital program. Again, we have 44 open projects. About three quarters of it is funded with bonds at this point, and a quarter of it in cash, I mean, at least in what is remaining to be spent. In January, we spent about 430000 most of that has to do with the installation of new overhead and new underground lines. Uh, also, we uh, installed uh, 75,000 in, in transformers and purchased about 40,000 meters. So that's kind of an overview of the expenditures uh, on our capital program this month. So uh, that's just kind of a quick overview of the financials. And if y'all have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Mr. Bertram. I think uh, maybe it would be uh, helpful for everybody just if you would remind us what the reserve requirement is for uh, for LPNL or what our policy <coughs> is on the reserve requirement. Just uh, if it's not working capital, it's something other than our, our reserves, as established by a, a council ordinance, is three months of operating revenues. That's the really the revenue strictly related to general consumers meters, um, and so we take uh, an average of. 12 months and three months of that is our reserves, which is about $56 million in reserves. At the end of uh, the fiscal year, I believe our reserves were around $65 million, so uh, about eight, 
$1.9 million in excess of uh, the reserve policy. Um, and keep in mind that we're, that amount that's over the policy level, we are going to use to smooth those rate increases over the next several years. If, if we were to use all those in one year, you, you may forego a year of rate increases, but the next year you may have a 12 or 15 percent rate increase. So we will be utilizing those reserves and, and chewing those reserves down to policy levels over the next several years, especially as we're bringing on a large amount of infrastructure uh, to the utility that will help us in keeping those rate increases on a consistent level basis going forward. Well, if our, if our cost of electricity goes up, then our reserves requirements go up. Absolutely. As, as, it's meant as, to be a buffer by you know, the balance sheet. It, it's all based on reserves. So, so, I mean, all based on revenue. So, yeah, if the purchase power costs are up, our reserve requirement goes up. If purchase power prices go down dramatically, then our reserve uh, policy would actually go down. So it, it's, it's all it's a fluid number, and but we track that on our financial models, and we, we we at least estimate what we think it's going to be over the next several years. And our goal is to always bring it down to policy levels. It's just impossible to always get it right on the money uh, every year. So. Other comments or questions for Mr. Parcher? Okay. If not, uh, then we'll move to item uh, nine. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Um, receive a report and discuss underground utility location and relocation activities and electric customer connections related to downtown redevelopment activities. We have a engineering representative here to uh, present present this uh, report. Jerry. Good afternoon. <laughs> Just a rundown here of our uh, phases and routes for the uh, new underground utility placement. Uh, phase one, we have a feeder line coming down Avenue O, it's already been completed. Phase two, involved Avenue M. Phase three, primarily involves Avenue J. Phase four and five are both future phases. Uh, four is west of Avenue Q, five being primarily the arts district. Just a brief overview of this presentation. Be the parties involved in their role in this project. Phase one, which was completed in 2014. Phase two, City contractor work is complete, and uh, we are now working to pull cable and terminate switch gear. Phase three, city contractor has started. Actually, this week they got started on that project. And the next item will be removal of our redundant former XL overhead facilities within the downtown area. And then the downtown survey costs associated with converting existing customer services to the new underground system. Questions. Okay, just a look at uh, the parties involved with this and uh, their roles. City of Lubbock, of course, is the project <coughs> leader. SGS Engineering is providing the design coordination of the project. McDougall Company, of course, is the master developer. Deerwood Construction, uh, they are the contractor that has just recently completed their conduit installation for phase two. Utility Contractors of America, they were awarded the bid for conduit installation in phase three. Uh, LPNL's role, along with the other overhead utilities, is to relocate our overhead facilities to underground as downtown redevelopment progresses. Here are just a few pictures of phase one. Uh, we have a switch cabinet here on the right. It's over there by the other Durango's. Uh, of course, we have the Conduit installation back in 2014. And we have a Padma transformer here that's in the alley right behind the United Way building. This kind of involves the target area that we were asked to vacate for development. Again, phase one was completed in 2014. It's just kind of a Google Maps view of the target area. Our underground feeder <coughs> along Avenue O is now in place and operating. 
LPL overhead facilities have been removed within the target block area. And as of this week, uh, NTS Communications has uh, informed us they are scheduled to remove their facilities this Saturday, March 19th. Mr. Ross. Hey, Jerry, I have yeah. a question. Are all utilities, I know we're back, back when we discussed this last time, but t was still kind of the last one to try to get done. Do you have any interaction with them as far as being the parties involved and where they're at? Absolutely, yeah. We uh, contact them quite a bit. I think uh, last time we did this, it was Suddenlink and NTS. Was, we're still on the polls. Um, Suddenlink, fairly quickly after that meeting, they were uh, very cooperative and actually got off the polls fairly quickly. Uh, haven't seen the same uh, quick response, I guess, out of NTS, but I know they are they are working. They've been working on cutting over customers the last few weeks, as I understand it. What about at and They're off. All. Yeah, it's just it's just one company at this point. It's and still NTS goes off this weekend, and that's it. If they get off this weekend, then yes, they will. That'll be it. Will that mean then the polls will be able to come out? Yes, sir. In the Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Here you set up a kind of an overview of our. Uh, routes here for phase two shows the the blue kind of indicate the switch cabinets which are existing now the red indicates kind of proposed we already have conduit in place along the new end here and it's just a matter of trying to pull cable terminate it's still some work we have to do there but the contractor for the city has completed their work for phase two here are the switches in question um, all these actually are contained within their own easements, except for one, which is this one here. You can tell it's in a sidewalk here, the deck of brick pavers. Um, but the first one here is on 10th and M on the northeast corner. That one there is actually next to the old city substation. It's currently inactive. Uh, the one on the right there is next to the old community health center building. And this one here, of course, does not look familiar. It's right here in front of the business center. And then the one on the, on the far bottom right is the uh, Experience life location. This is our first new underground distribution loop. Uh, it's at the First United Methodist Church, right again, right across the street. Um, we were able to get them off of the old network feed that we had in place, been there forever. Uh, they were very cooperative, worked with us. They wanted to improve their services as much as we did. So they actually built this nice little brick enclosure around the new pad and the transform, as you can see here. And so they're now served off of that. And uh, when phase, when we are able to bring in our, our cable conductors for phase two, we'll be able to complete this loop and have an open point here. So we'll have a loop between phase one and two. This is the uh, Rager Docks Green Building. It's almost complete with their renovation. Uh, we did provide new underground service to this building. Completed in 2015. Uh, it is now temporarily being fed from the existing overhead facilities, but it is uh, planned to tie this into the phase three duct system when it becomes available. You can see the transformer on the right there. It's actually put in the sideline. New service to the business center. New switch cabinet installed as part of phase two will be utilized to serve the business center. A uh, new pad mount transformer is planned to replace the old and deteriorating network fault transformers that are currently serving this facility. And following completion, it will allow for further overhead facility removal blocks east and north of this block. Here's an overview of phase three. Again, you can kind of see phase one here and having O, phase two and M, and then you see phase three, the route here is much, much longer. It starts over here at Mac Davis. And in terms of the city contract, they'll actually extend it all the way to 19th Street. Mr. Austin, I have a question. Oh, sure, go ahead. Business center, which is that exactly? Where well, this, we refer to this as business center. We'll call it business center. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. 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 Uh, our uh, our facilities for the time being will stop here at uh, 14th Street. We will actually serve the uh, new citizens tower 
from both phases three and two, a loop here. Uh, obviously, won't have any facilities in place yet for phase three as it just started. Excuse me, you have yeah. any pictures of, the, of some existing alleys? Um, I, I mean, I'm just curious. I have a picture coming up showing kind of a difference between where overhead facilities haven't been taken down, but they've been cleaned up, I would say. That's really, I don't have a whole lot of the specific alleys. Okay. So, I can, we'll get to that in a little bit. Mr. Butler. Do you have anything going on around the element as far as the vault being part of the network? The old vault? The network transforms in the vault to the Omni are gone. We've, we've yanked all that out. After the uh, van, vandalism that took place, we went ahead and got those transformers out of there. It was an unsafe situation. We got them out. It's currently being served off of uh, the temporary construction power to help the, the guys doing the abatement work. Um, we do have plans coming up to set a new pad mount transformer to serve that building, along with the parking garage and the entire complex, basically. <laughs> Luck would have it. Uh, <laughs> uh, new underground service to Citizen Sour. Asbestos abatement being served by temporary power. And phase three will include common installation to serve Citizen Sour. The transformer plant being installed uh, south of the parking garage currently in the, the parking spot. The city's going to let us have. New service to the federal building. The old service has deteriorated and become very unreliable. Conversion to new service will allow further overhead facility removal to the south. Accommodations have also been made to serve the old post office building at 712 Broadway, currently under renovation. You might have the red tile building that used to be a part of the county's facility. back to your point earlier, uh, removal of our redundant overhead facilities. Approximately 90% of the redundant overhead facilities have been removed from downtown. The downtown being Avenue Q to I-27, Marshall Sharp to 19. Approximately a total of five miles of three-phase primary has been taken down. That doesn't mean we don't still have overhead downtown, but we don't have as much as we did before, if that, if that makes sense. Hundreds of poles cut or topped above the telecommunications facilities. Dozens of poles have been removed where possible. A lot of times we can't just take the poles out for the same reason we probably have in phase one of the target area. You just, you've got cable TV there. All we can do is you know, take our facilities down, cut the poles off. That's as far as we can go until something else happens or stay vacate the poles. Here's the Best picture, I guess, I have available on this slide. It's kind of a before and after you know, cleanup of an alley in the depot district. This is on 19th and Buddy Holly, right behind kind of Tornado Gallery. You can see this old transformer rack here, kind of rusted old transformers that weren't really in use anyway. Electrically came through and cleaned up the alley. This is, I mean, you still have overhead facilities in the alley, but it's you know, obviously much improved. This kind of gives you some subtle aesthetic improvement as well as uh, reducing the facilities that we have to energize and maintain. Most of those still have, what, what do you call that, a weather, weather top? Weather, like a weatherhead? Weatherhead. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and the depot district uh, currently, based on the, 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 the plans for downtown, there is no plans currently for any underground placement for the depot district. Okay. So that's kind of the best we can do right now. Converting existing customers to the new underground system. The biggest difference between North Overton redevelopment and downtown redevelopment are the existing customers. North Overton was essentially completely demolished and then rebuilt with new developments. Uh, in that case, very few existing services had to be maintained during redevelopment. However, in downtown, the majority of existing customers will have to be maintained or converted during redevelopment. That's kind of our challenge. Cost study to convert customer services to meet the new underground system. 
An electrician was hired to look at types of services downtown based on size, voltage, and type of connection. He provided us cost estimates based on outside visual inspection only. And I must stress, only on the outside visual inspection. There wasn't a whole lot to go off of. It's the kind of best he could do. Cost estimates given are obviously very conceptual and for planning purposes only. This kind of gives you an overview of the kind of the area of downtown we focused in on for this study. Uh, it's basically bordered by 10th Street to the north, 15th Street to the south, and Avenue in to the west, Avenue F on the east. So it's kind of, I call it the core of the central business district, basically. Four basic types of services downtown, electrician costs normally paid for by the customer. You have small 12240 Delta three phase services, and uh, we kind of based this estimate on the uh, service at the 1600 block of Main Street. I can't tell you these are quite common. They're small, but they're quite common downtown. Uh, medium uh, 208 three phase services uh, fed by secondary risers where you actually have you know, a pipe going in the ground from an overhead pole to feed a customer. Um, and based on a service that we located at 1600 block at 10th Street, into about 20,000. Another medium uh, size service, same voltage. Uh, this one actually fed by an overhead drop, a weatherhead, like you said. Uh, and we based this one on a, a service at 1200 block at 13th Street, came in a little bit higher, 25,000. And then a large. 208 volt service three phase, uh, also fed by overhead drop, based on service at 1200 uh, block of Avenue J. They gave us an estimate about 40,000 for that type of service. Now, on very large installations with overhead service entrances, uh, they'll have to be looked at on a case by case basis. Uh, those costs will be very dependent on internal inspection of customer owned equipment. It's very difficult to come out with a number based on some really, really large installations that we have downtown. Mr. Ross, uh, how long did it take for this electrician to do this specific study? How long did it take him? Yeah. Uh, I couldn't say exactly how long it took. I mean, it, it took him a few weeks to get back to us in the first place, but. Um, I guess from the time I requested this uh, study be done, for this estimate to be done, to the time he actually presented the paperwork to us, about a month. Yes, sir. Okay. Was this a paid study? Yes, sir. Yeah, we hired an electrician to do this. What did the study cost us? Oh, the study itself? Yeah. Well, just in terms of what we hired the electrician for? 100% sure how much we paid. That wasn't very much. He really only looked at four different locations. He looked at four locations? Four, yes. He didn't comb through downtown looking at these different services. He just looked at four different. The idea was you categorize four typical types of services downtown and then base a cost across downtown area based on those four typical types of services that you see. I mean, I think it actually took about a 10 block area out of what the 40 blocks or so mm -hmm. that did the did the 10 blocks because it's so time intensive and it's kind of hard to go to each single different business to get the session. So basically they <coughs> just had a study of 10 blocks and then multiplied it. So it's an estimate that um, unless you get into a very in-depth uh, study with electricians then it's just hard to get a firm figure or know what you are looking at because of the inside of the building right. may need upgrades and <coughs> it's just this is just based on the outside vision of what we would have to do up to a certain point so in that in that situation where maybe an inside of the building needs an upgrade, back to the, the fundamental point of what we're looking for, <coughs> would that be typically borne a cost borne by the customer in yes. a changeover? Yes. 
So I, I own a building downtown, and I get a call one day, and, I, and they say it's going to cost twenty thousand dollars, and you need to do about seventy five hundred dollars worth of upgrades inside the building. I say why, and they say well because the city of Lubbock is upgrading a lot. And then I say something that I'm not going to say in the public record. So my question <laughs> is. We could be dealing with two million. We could be dealing with twenty million, right? The question hasn't changed, by the way. And so, um, what is holding us back from doing an in-depth study? Just need to do it. That's that's our point. Is we don't know exactly where to stop, and you know, we we've, we've never looked at doing anything in the past to certain point. Right. But, Maybe get into something like this from that. So you have to contact every customer individually mm -hmm. and yeah. allow access to their building or facility. But if you own a building, wouldn't you rather have been contacted now than told later? So, yes. so my point is, is that I understand it's involved, and I understand as a property owner, I'd much rather go through the inconvenience of letting somebody come into my building now rather than getting a bill later and not having had the opportunity to know what was coming. So we'll talk about that offline. Yeah. My, my point in all this is I think it's good work. Uh, what we're trying to get to is a number so that us and the city council uh, can have a very detailed <coughs> discussion of how we're going to handle the potential of millions of dollars in expenses that we're basically dictating to all these property owners. Mr. Chairman, it's not going to matter. Once you get to your property line, if you do anything with electrical, water, whatever, you have to bring that building under code. Yeah. All of those buildings downtown are old. old. They're all going to have to be brought up to code because I can assure you the majority of those are not up to code anyway. Right. Even in our business, if we touch a water line, that's, that building has to be brought up to code completely. Well, that's at the owner's expense. That's not the city's expense. Just because that building is not up to code now and the codes have changed. It's the same difference. Well, now the city may have upgraded the electrical up to the building, but that is at the owner's expense, and that's just part of, of redoing a building. I'm fine with that, but I don't have to take the political heat. Six months ago, as a group, we were all discussing we might want to look at this from some kind of policy perspective as to whether or not if it's a $10 million issue, it may be worth more discussion than just telling everybody it's a problem. Well, I think you can even say up to, up to the building. Sure. Inside the building, I agree with you. If you want to put that on there, $1,000 up to the building. But he's saying they don't really know even what it costs to get up to the building unless they go into the building. That's what I'm understanding. That's not what I heard. I well, heard that's up to the building. Essentially, it's up to the building, but it's up to the metering point, basically. Okay. Well, past, it's the same thing. Essentially, it's past, past, past the meter, it's the customer. Anyway. Right. So can you do a study that is detailed and in-depth and property by property without having to see it inside of the building? No, you can't. Mm -hmm. well, how are we going to know what to get to the building? That would be your responsibility as a property owner. No, I'm saying how do we get to the building? You're saying you get to the meter. To the meter. The other side of the meter is the property owner's right. responsibility. So Absolutely. that's what they're doing. They're to the meter. So you can do an outside visual inspection and give an accurate cost to the meter. Two things here. We got costs to LPNL to build LPNL facilities right. underground to meet right. an existing service. Right. And you have a connection point and you have the customer facilities. Right. There's very little that you can see externally about the customer's facilities. And that's what this was basically based on. All I want, all I asked for a while back, was an accurate estimate of what it costs to go from our new underground line to the metering point of the building. Nobody was discussing back then inside changes to the building. Our underground new line to the metering service. You're talking about LPNL facilities. Nothing customer owned. Okay, no line to the customer's meter. The inside facility is going to take some time for the external. Look, it is. Oh, definitely. Yeah. 
convey that to them. My question is simple, is how do we get an accurate estimate of what that point, not, not inside, I get it, but like for my building to go from a new line in the alley or wherever it's gonna be to the metering point, am I getting a bill for 15 grand or for 1500 or for 20 grand? That's gonna be different on every property. This isn't just my question. This has been a, an issue for three years right here. Nobody wants to tackle what is the cost from line to meter to get to, to, get to the meter. I think, part of, I think part of our struggle here is that there, there would be quite an expense to hire someone to be able to come in and, and, and make that effort. And, and I guess the question then becomes, we are, we are spending a lot of money to do an estimate for something that a customer would pay for it's not LPNL infrastructure that we're paying somebody to estimate. It, it would be very similar to us estimating how much it's going to cost somebody to install solar panels on their own roof. Uh, we, are, we are spending public funds to do a study that would benefit a customer. And so I think that's where our, our struggle is, is you know, we, could bring a, we could bring a contract to you for, I don't know, two or three, four hundred thousand dollars to do a study to tell us how much it's going to cost, but, should, but are, are we even able or willing or legally can we spend that money on infrastructure that's not our infrastructure i think that's where we struggle and, and i think this was hopefully a a go between to provide some estimate of uh, you know kind of a magnitude of what cost would be on individual properties exclusive of those really big facilities downtown which are very highly com complex and complicated and so I, I think that's maybe we need some direction from the board on do we do we spend a whole bunch of money for a study to get a cost that's not our infrastructure? This, you're exactly right, and you could not have summed that up more clearly and, and correctly, in my opinion. This goes back to Mark being on the board, Mark McDougall and Leanne Dunlop. There was one new service farm put in, and there was a big disagreement. What was the bill? A couple grand? Thirteen hundred, I think. Sixteen hundred. There was a huge disagreement on who's paying that one bill, and that led to a discussion of whoa, we're going to have thousands of these bills come in and thousands of these fires and over two grand we had a huge fire for a month. That led to the discussion of what are we going to do when all of a sudden we have hundreds and thousands of these bills showing up and hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds and thousands of people coming up mad. So back then we had discussed somebody's got to go to the, es go to the effort to estimate what we're doing to our ratepayers as far as changes that wouldn't have to be made if they weren't getting new underground lines. Mark was saying that the city and the LPNL needed to get together, have that information get together and come up with a plan. I'm just saying we need to put a, if we don't want to study it and it's just part of the ratepayers issue, then I can be fine with that. Political tendencies change, that's fine. I'm just saying put a, we need to put, bring this to a head and either say it's a the ratepayer's issue or study it and put some kind of finality to it. Nobody knows if we're talking two million or 10 million. And so politically, the discussion six or eight months ago was, we need to put an accurate estimate together. Whether the city pays for part of that, we pay for part of that, maybe nobody can pay for it. Politically, the discussion was, we need to know what we're doing. I guess I'm not following you. Are you trying to get us to tell a customer what it's gonna cost them? For the new underground lines. Are you? No, I'm trying to say we don't know by burying the lines, we don't know what we're causing, costing everybody. There's nobody that's ever determined what that expense that, that is, everybody's going to incur. Well, we just need to discuss it that way. Mr. Bowman, help me out here. I don't quite understand. Who is paying for the transition from overhead? underground at the entrance. I don't care about the inside of the building. I understand that. Well, city, LPNL, everybody's paying to put their lines underground. Well, but what about the expense on the building to go to the underground section rather than the top of the overhead? That's the issue. Because LPNL has created the problem by changing their system. Right? Yes. Now, is LPNL going to pay for that or is it the customer? Back then, and Andy will correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure, but back then, I think it was debatable if LPNL could legally pay for it. I think that's still the question. 
even if we could, if we wanted to, but if the board agreed unanimously, there was a very big question as to whether we legally could even do that. Um, well, yeah, of course, the bottom line is well, LPNL has created a problem by changing their method of service. Right. But, you know, there's a couple, there's a couple of factors that, that impact the, the ultimate decision here. And one of them is that the, the facilities we have downtown are in very deteriorating condition and they need to be replaced. I think if we're going to replace them, we want to replace them using the, the nice conduit system that's been in downtown. Otherwise, we're going to have ongoing reliability issues like we, like, like we have experienced here. Like all you guys that work downtown have experienced routinely. So that's a big problem. There's, there are some shortcut ways that we could solve this problem without spending a lot of money. They don't, they don't ultimately fix the problem. But for example, if you got a, if you got a service that's coming out overhead right now, and we're removing our overhead line so that service can't be fed overhead anymore. You can still run conduits up and just make the connections up without without changing the customer's service end. So yeah, that's one way. It's not it's not ideal, but it's a way of getting there. And that's that's not very expensive to do that. The, the, one of the questions that we have, one of the problems that we've had that working with working on this estimate is that okay, if you take out a permit and replace that meter base with one that goes underground, new and modern, and you have to make some change, you may have to make some changes to the breaker panel inside, but and technically, I think when you take out a permit on a facility, you're supposed to bring everything up. No, that's where it gets really expensive. And that's where, you know, unless there was some waiver from the code office from the city to, to allow them to make changes to the boxes without bringing the entire building up to code at that point in time, you know, it might be too expensive for any of us to want to deal with. Well, so that, that's all I'm trying to get to is what if we pull a permit? Say we figure it out, we pull a permit. And on my building, they say, man, you got $10,000 worth of electrical work to bring it up to code. And I say, I don't want it up to code. It's working just fine like it is. <laughs> Grandfather. But, but my point is, so we could be triggering the cost to connect and the cost to upgrade. Yeah, because if you pull a permit. Well, what if you pull a permit? Or not you, but what if they pull a permit? I, I don't know. I mean, just like David said, I don't know about that. But if the homeowner or business owner yeah. pulls that permit, it has to be done in code if you start messing those words. Unless there's a waiver statement. Unless we agree to do, do a waiver. Unless we within that area. And they may, ask, I don't know. Let me ask another question. If, if out on if in tech tariffs there's reliability issues right. and LPNL decides to replace some infrastructure. Correct me if I'm not wrong, but all ratepayers help that infrastructure Right? Yes. Yeah. So that's another policy issue we're dealing with is the downtown, the, you know, each building owner, each property owner is effectively helping pay for that new infrastructure rather than the whole system carrying the cost mm -hmm. just on that connection piece. So you just gonna remember this all started over I think less than two thousand dollar bill. I forget what building it was. Yeah. This little fire started there. So we're talking about a, a whole lot bigger fire on this hill. So, so, so one thing we had talked about this term of year is, is setting up a 380 fund, I think is the right terminology for it, where there would be a fund set up by the city, 380 fund that would be where customers could apply for and receive uh, grants, I think is the correct term, you get a grant for upgrading your building. We can't do that because we're not authorized to to give away anything of value, but a 380 corporation could do that. In the, the city, the city could. Well, the city could. So that's that's one possibility, one possible way to get around this problem. And then you got to you got to figure out how to fund that 380, how much money to put in there. You know, based on the work that Jared has brought you today, we think it's going to be at least at least a half a million dollars, and probably much more than that. So I don't know if you would want to if you would want to do that and fund it with an initial amount and then. See how far it goes. Uh, to me, that's a better approach than try, than us trying to do a detailed cost of estimate on every every single building downtown for, for stuff that's uh, you know really customer, customer associated work. We we can certainly move on. Sorry. The last thing I'll say is I'm as big of a proponent of doing all this as anyone since I, a long time since Mark and I were sitting on the board together. 
he had these problems, I've sat there and wondered how is this going to get solved. And maybe there's a 385 I've never heard of that. Maybe there is something like that. Maybe y'all can look at it. Maybe we can all look at it. Somehow somebody's got to get a handle on it. Is it half a million or is it five million? I think part of the argument from the city standpoint, Clayton, I probably call it that differently because I don't own any property in downtown. <clears throat> but I know the master developer has told us, you know, we have these little small footprints. If we put the underground, we can make bigger blocks. We can attract some outside developers and all that sort of thing. It would seem to me that the upgrade of the downtown facilities, even though the cost would be going by the property owner, the value of their property should go up as a result. At some point in time, it may be five years or 10 years or 15 years, but there's an opportunity for that owner who invested some money in their property to uh, to do rather well, potentially. Tell Victor that when he gets in the middle. Yeah, <laughs> Mr. Nunn. Um, I know the rest of the board is enjoying my silence on this issue. I, I can speak for only myself. I am a property owner. A direct financial interest in whatever decision it, we're making decisions based upon money. So I will not be, uh, just for the board chairman, I will not be weighing in on this issue, nor will I be able to vote on this issue. Well, I think it's uh, it's always been an issue. Uh, if there's new construction, obviously they're going to have to uh, they're going to have to go to that cost. I think the issue has always been. Changeover, it's the reconnection that issue that you that you were in. And I think uh, we probably do need to do need to figure out what is our path forward on that. If, if we have if that's our job to uh, to even determine. Well maybe I'll I will go ahead and say I'll put an agenda item on it. I'd like to go with a marker both let them come in and it's been months since I've talked to them about it. Next, next month, I'll ask one or both of them to come in and get their thoughts on it. Um, so, I mean, you know, we need to get this issue and put a plan in place. But again, like Charlie said, I won't be able to vote on it because I'm going to have property down here. But. Well, I want to say, I, I'm a proponent for under, these underground lines being done. Sure. It, it yeah. needs we, to be done. Be. It needs to be cleaned up. Now, who pays for putting it into those buildings? I don't know. I, I want to make it as easy on the consumer as possible, obviously. But I don't want it to cost the, the city a whole lot of money either. So there's got to be some kind of compromise that we, we do. It's out there. We just got to go find it. Right. And whether we bring Delbert Mark in or... or we just uh, need to have the agenda item on and we'll continue the discussion. And, and I think, I guess, I guess uh, from what I hear from, from you, Mr. Hughes, and from Stone, it's basically on a property by property basis, even your even your estimates or the electrician's estimates are not firm enough to say here's if you take that ten blocks and go property by property meeting, that's not gonna be really a firm estimate. No, these are not firm. These are for planning purposes only kind of give us an idea of what you're looking at okay. over that. And like I said, we're not even talking about the entire central business district or even the entire entirety of the four phases that are being developed. This is just kind of the core of downtown. You can take that and you know, extrapolate that to wherever you need to, but it's it is very <coughs> bare bones and the best we could do with what we had right now. It's like an electrician just can't get yeah, inside so customer. Those building. figures in red are what the property owner would pay. Well, uh, what a property owner would typically pay to themselves. That's their normally, yes. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Hey, Richard, one, one question I'd like to get out there. I'd like to be, I'm curious, like the federal building. If we don't, if we have a plan in place that the property owner pays the connection fee, are we billing the federal government? Are we, because there's a lot of uh, government owned buildings down here. They would, they would pay as everybody else would. So everybody would get billed the same. Uh, I don't have any idea what it would be. Well, I can tell you from like a 
look at the federal building and like the green building since they were doing their own renovations internally they paid obviously for their their, their customer side and kind of did a collaboration to improve the service on both sides same thing with the united methodist church that's so those best, situations are ideal that's the best scenario is you got somebody coming in renovating the building and they, yeah. they're just working in part of their overall project Aaron, thank you yeah no problem Guys, appreciate the information. It's, you know, as, as you see, this is something that there's been a lot of uh, stirring around on for a long time. So, appreciate the information, and I'm sure we'll be talking about it now. Yep. I've got like one more slide if you go. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I want to cut you short. <laughs> We're almost done, I promise. Uh, just in summary. <laughs> This is a very unique uh, project with many challenges, many of which are unique to each block uh, that are targeted for development. Um, and our distribution system downtown will receive a tremendous upgrade in both capability and reliability of this project. Uh, that is for sure. And again, you know, previously we provided cost estimates are for planning purposes only and are not at all intended for budgeting or cost projections across the entire central district. Thank you. All the questions sounds like so. Very good. Yeah. Thank y'all. <coughs> okay, then we'll move on to item 10. Consider a resolution approving and requesting the city council to amend the fiscal year 2015-2016 capital program. <coughs> Mr. Cather, do I need to read every one of them? Oh, sure. <laughs> As outlined in your agenda. And uh, I think we have already seen a slide on that. I guess the proper way to proceed with that would be just entertain a motion and then we'll discuss. I, I move that for, uh, we include the amendments. Second. A motion made by Mr. Dunn, second by Mr. Bowman uh, to approve item 10. So, any discussion? Looks like Mr. Bowman, you've got a budget amendment detail. I'm actually going to take this. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that, that's fine. So, just a quick rundown. Uh, I know that those numbers are small, and um, I don't expect you to read them. Uh, but you, you do have this in your backup. Uh, the slide is a little bit different. Our totals in the backup uh, are a little bit off. But uh, what, what the actual amendment is doing is we're reducing a portion of the capital program by about $18 million, 18.9. Um, that's going to impact 14 of our 19 capital projects. Um, of that 18.9 million, 15 million um, is related to bond funding on the first 13 capital projects. Um, and a lot of that's due to the fact that we were planning on a 230 KV loop. And as we have gone through this process of integrating to ERCOT, we know that we uh, don't need the 230 KV loop. And so that has impacted a lot of the capital projects. So, um, so that's the big reduction. Uh, the other uh, there in point B in your back up, the $3.8 million is related to the controls upgrade at Madisonville Station. We're going to delay those funds, uh, which is item 14 in this backup, um, until the design, engineering, and preliminary work is done. Um, the first five items will be the funding. You can see up at the top, the funding will be shift, shifted to uh, fiscal year 16, 17, and 6 through 14. We are going to review and revise and possibly completely eliminate some of these projects in the current budget that we're working on for 16 and 17. Um, again, just a lot has changed with uh, the integration of ERCOT and uh, we just didn't want to issue debt for projects we weren't going to be able to get to this year. So in a nutshell, that's, that's the budget. Everybody clear? Oh, Mr. Bill. In, in essence, this is an ERCOT driven uh, budget amendment that we need to uh, focus our energies on those upgrades that we need for the ERCOT transition. It, it's, it's, it would really be necessary whether we stay or whether we go. It's really a reliability and transmission system change because we were like, well, it really, I guess it really is because the 230 KV loop would have been necessary if we built a plant you know in your backyard where now the 115 outer loop and 69 kv inner loop will work best with ties from the ERCOT system so so, so it, 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 it's kind of a little bit of both but there's a 2019 upgrade it's a 2019 yeah that I would care, that's a very characterization 
and it, it fits into our capital improvement plan that we've told the public that we're in incrementally increasing that small portion of our rates every year so that we can do these types of things. And so that's what this project is and I recommend it be we're approving it. Okay. Any other discussion, comments? Uh, we still have our quorum. Yes, <laughs> oh, we do. <laughs> All those in favor, uh, please say aye. Aye. Uh -huh. Any opposed? Okay. So we'll do that with the way. Yes, that's fine. Uh, um, moving along to the consent agenda. Um, item 11 is consider a resolution authorizing the chairman of the utility board to execute that certain interlocal agreement bind between the city of Lubbock and the county of Lubbock related to, ac related to access to portions of the city of Lubbock utility database for legitimate law enforcement activities. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I need to uh, pull that item from the consent agenda and would ask that we uh, continue that item until the next agenda meeting, which will be in April, and that would be my motion. Okay, motion to continue. Second. Second from Mr. Bell. Now, any discussion on that? Would you like to elaborate a little further? Yes, there are, um, <coughs> I've discussed this with uh, Mr. Kasner, and there are certain um, portions of this agreement that need to be changed so that we can better protect the privacy of our rate holders, I'm sorry, our rate payers and customers, but at the same time, protect the citizens of Lubbock by allowing law enforcement to do their job. And so <clears throat> with that, with those changes that uh, we contemplate, we can discuss that at the next meeting, and if the board is in, a, in uh, agreement with those changes, then we can approve the agreement at that time. The best way would be a change in the language or additional language that would further refine the resolution. As to what items can be seen by law enforcement without warning. Okay. Also, uh, I saw, I can't find it now, but there's some, the language seems just a little bit vague about uh, do we allow law enforcement, somebody from the county to come over. Would they actually sit down at a keyboard or would they just ask someone for certain information and an LPL employee would act, or a city employee would ask them. They, they would be escorted to a computer and the computer would be set up where they could see certain screens that would have the personal information largely redacted. Uh, and they would never be left alone with that. That would be a key to uh, But the law enforcement officer would actually be stroking the keyboard. Yes, sir. But restricted access. I mean, they, they don't have full open they access. They couldn't get it. They'd have to look at these specific screens that were the code. Might look at that language, see if you're comfortable with it. I mean, that's it seems yeah. to be like that. Okay. Um, any other any other uh, comments or suggestions on that? All those in favor of the motion to continue that item, uh, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Six, six, uh, item 12 is consider a resolution recommending to the city council, city council of the city of Lubbock to award RFP 16-12664J Eon respecting the installation of the emergency generator at the Lubbock Business Center, 1301 Broadway, Lubbock, Texas, T. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Tech Contracting LLC. Uh, I'll entertain a motion. Well, you, you yeah. have to pull, might as well ask to pull it. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. First of all, how much will it cost? And secondly, there's been a lot of talk about moving everything from this building over to the building of the cost is 393000 is, is the contract amount to install this generator. Um, it is a generator that could be relocated. Um, it's not. I mean, you definitely have some expense relocated, but yeah, well, you see uh, where I'm going, though. I mean, right. if we're not going to be here very long, well, you know, at the present time, it's around you know three to four years, 
And at the present time, if we have an outage, we have no way to be contacted. We have no way to communicate with our customers. Uh, no one can call into our call center. And it's just one of those, um, really from a customer service perspective, um, if we can't take the calls during an outage, I mean, oh, we agree. should be. Yeah, that, that's been our concern. And so, you know, my what I would envision is that um, you know, once this facility, we're complete with this facility and we'll be moving to another and this generator can be repurposed for either a portion of the facility over there or for another city's facility that might need generator capacity. So I don't think it, it's just a four year investment. I think it, it can be seen as a longer term investment, but we still have three or four years that we've got to maintain operations and maintain communication. So that, that was kind of my bigger concern was that, you know, we have to have in electricity at all times to be able to take answer questions and well, take care of our customers. So it, it, is, it is expensive. You've been in this building a many number of years now. So right. And this is one of the, you know, our municipal hill has a generator, city hall has a generator. This is one of the larger facilities that are owned by the city that have not been equipped with the generator to date. So we felt that it was um, the kind of responsibility of ours to, to make sure that's. Well, clear. I don't have an objection. I don't think I'll take this question. And my reconciliation of that is that it can be repurposed going forward, or we could even sell it. Uh, you know, at, at that point, if it's if we're not able, because it won't be, but just you know, three or four years old at that point in time. So that, that's how I reconcile it. I, I agree with you that it's difficult to invest something like that for a short period of time, but I think we can extend a lot of that or repurpose it somewhere. Motion approved. Good. I second. Move. Okay, motion to approve by Mr. Bell, second by Mr. Dunn. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed. Okay. I believe that gets us to the end of the agenda. Uh, so we will see you.